Hello everyone, and welcome to Astronomy 101. This is the pilot episode. I'm Dr. Ashley Nova, I'm your host and lecturer, and today we're beginning a journey into the wonderful world of astronomy. Hello! Hi everyone. So, what is Astronomy 101, you ask? I know you are. This is going to be sort of an interactive learning experience. With This is a show where we're going to learn, we're going to explore, and we're going to wonder. This is the pilot, but I'm hoping this is going to be a series where we're going to explore the big questions. Where did we come from? What's that big glowy ball in the sky and that other shiny ball? Where do stars come from and why do they move across the sky? How come the planets move differently? What are galaxies and globular clusters and dark matter? How are stars born? Where do black holes come from? If the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? How is this all going to work? Well, I, I want to think about this as a classroom. I'm your lecturer and y'all are my students, but I don't want this to be a passive lecture or a YouTube science video. We've got something amazing here on Twitch, which is that we're live and we can chat and we can talk um, and you can interact with me in real time, just like a real classroom. That means if you have questions, you can ask them and I'll do my best to answer them as we go. We'll also be able to do tasks and I might even ask you some questions. I hope you're all ready to open your minds and get ready to learn. In today's lesson, I'm going to take you back in time. And we're going to delve we're going to delve into the history of the world's oldest science. First question, am I alive? Yes. Do do we have to take notes? You don't have to take notes because there's going to be a vod so you can just go back and watch it. <laughs> um Today's learning objectives, as you can see here, I'm going to try and get you to understand why we do astronomy. Um, we're going to learn about the origin of some of the world's calendar systems and how they work. And then we're going to learn about famous astronomers and their work over the past 4,000 or so years. You bought me an apple? Thank you so much. Is it a, is it a Tim apple? There's a politics reference for you. So, let's get started, shall we? What is astronomy? To understand what astronomy is, we first have to understand what science is. If astronomy is the science of space, what does that mean? To me, science means studying and learning about the laws that govern our universe and making models that fit our observations and make new predictions. Science provides us with a framework of tools, methods, and ideas about how we observe, record, and interpret the universe, and drives us to find things that we don't understand. Step one on becoming a scientist is admitting that there are things that you don't know. Only then can we start asking questions and finding answers. To me, the best science happens when your answers lead to more questions. When you explain one thing, but in the process discover something new and exciting that you don't have a model for yet. And that's why I love astronomy. Every day we get to look at the skies and we can find something new, a new object, a new structure, a new behavior, and have no idea how to explain it. Now, people have said that astronomy is the science that puts you in your place. It makes you realize how unimportant and insignificant human life is because we're all just space dust in an infinite universe. But to me, it's the exact opposite. To me, astronomy lets us learn about the deepest intricacies of how the universe works on a grand scale. And we're part of that universe. We are a set of eyes that the universe has created to learn about itself. And what a job we've done so far. In the short, short lives of humanity, 10,000 years, we have learned that we live on a ball of rock, magma, and iron, 
that's 6,000 kilometers across and spinning at 1,600 kilometers per hour. We're blasting around in space, orbiting a ball of burning gas called the sun at 30 kilometers per second. We have a companion called the moon that we've sent people to and they have walked on it. We're in a system of eight planets and numerous dwarf planets, asteroids, comets, and moons. The sun's influence stretches out into interstellar space, past the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. Our solar system is one of millions orbiting 250 quadrillion kilometers from the center of a galaxy called the Milky Way. The Milky Way has spiral arms and a supermassive black hole at its center. It's surrounded by dwarf galaxies and clusters of stars and sits in a strange halo of dark matter. Our galactic neighbors of Andromeda and Triangulum make up our local group, but it's just one group of galaxies in the Virgo cluster, which is just one cluster in the cosmic web of matter that makes up the observable universe. The observable universe, which is 93 billion light years across, and is getting bigger by the second because of a mysterious force called dark energy. Now, all that might make you feel small. It might does make some people feel insignificant. Or, if you're anything like me, and you have a massive ego, it makes you marvel and wonder, because we did that. Human beings working together and pooling our knowledge over thousands of years, some of the greatest minds in all of history, discovered all of that. And you might now be asking yourself, but how did we do it? What does an astronomer even do? Something I ask myself every day when I go to work. Now, when I introduce myself as an astronomer, one of two things usually happen. Either the person I'm talking to says something to the effect of, Oh my god, that's so cool. You must be so smart. Do you have a telescope? Or they say, Oh my god, I love astronomy. I'm a Pisces. Which... Oof. Now, I'm not going to deride on astrology too much, um, because while its modern-day interpretations are scientifically bollocks, um, it holds an important historical context. Many historical astronomers didn't use telescopes, but were active astrologers, and they, their desire to study the skies was driven by a search to predict the behaviours of people and the world around them. Now, I'm sorry lesbians, but the position of the stars and planets at the time of your birth isn't going to tell you if Jill is a good match for you. Um, you should just swipe right and talk to them. Um, so, astronomers study the skies. Using our eyes to begin with, we developed sextants and other devices for measuring angles to stars. We've made telescopes photographic film, and high-grade digital detectors. Some of the greatest cameras in the world are bolted onto telescopes. But we don't just look at things. In fact, most mon modern astronomers never look through telescopes. We're mathematicians and physicists and statisticians. There are thousands of people studying space who don't even look at space. They build simulations and models and predict what might be seen for other astronomers to go out and look for. There are engineers who design and build our telescopes, our satellites and our rovers, software designers who build computer analysis tools and data processing pipelines, astrophysics, planetary science, astrobiology, astrochemistry, cosmology, stellar atmospheric physics, hydrodynamics, instrumentation design, and it doesn't stop there. Beyond the science is the people communicating the science. The teachers, science communicators, artists, and yes, even online video nerds are all part of the astronomy world. 
Astronomers come in all different shapes and sizes, in different forms, studying hundreds of topics with different skills and backgrounds. In my opinion, anyone who is interested in the sky is enough to look up and wonder why is an astronomer, and that includes you. Dear viewers, you are all astronomers. In modern astronomy, the math precedes the observations. Uh, yes, I would say in nearly all science, the math precedes the observation, because you need to predict something. You can't just go out and point a telescope somewhere and hope you're going to find something, unless you're the Hubble Space Telescope and you're looking for the extra deep field. Math... In, in, to be honest, most astronomers don't do maths in their daily, like, daily work, but there is always a math bit somewhere that has preceded the work that they're doing. There, there are predictions from the data and from the theory that need to be done before we can go out and observe. Because otherwise we're just pointing telescopes and looking at pretty things and you don't get funding for that. Um, so that's what astronomy is and hopefully that's given you enough insight into what's to come over this series um, and an idea of what astronomers do. Um, maybe we should get funding for that. I agree. I agree we should get funding for that. Um, I want to take us on a different course now. Now that we've learned about what astronomy is, I want to talk about what astronomy was and talk a little bit about science history. I want to show you how ancient civilizations used their knowledge of astronomy to build monuments. And I want to take a look at a problem that was solved the world over countless times. How do we know how long a year is? So astronomy is the oldest natural science in the world, dating all the way back to the earliest humans. You may know that the word astronomy comes from the Greek astronomos, meaning star arranging. But the practice goes back much further, from Neolithic hunter-gatherers to the ag agricultural societies of Mesopotamia, ancient China, Egypt, the Aztecs and the Romans, Humans have always looked upwards, but again, we don't just look up to marvel at the beauty of the heavens, but to understand the world that we live in. Early societies ascribed gods and spirits to the stars, finding patterns in the sky that we call constellations. Using these patterns, they learned how to predict the coming of wet and dry seasons, track when the tides change, and even navigate land and sea. The sky was a predictable, reliable, and repeatable system. The connections with gods and spirits means that early astronomy was likely a religious practice performed by priests, not scientists. Many ancient structures, one of my favourite being Stonehenge in Salisbury, seem to have very deliberate astronomical alignments, which required an understanding of mathematics to achieve and likely served astronomical, religious, and societal purposes. Yeah, T Fox, that's that's definitely part of um, part of it. So observing the sky over and over again, and waiting until things line up, and counting how many days that is. Exactly, exactly. The the. The sky is repeatable, like I said. It always it always comes back around again. Oh my god, phone. Phone. Shush. Um, so let's take a look at Stonehenge um, and how it's arranged with the skies. Um, leading to the monument is a two and a half kilometer road. Um, it's called the Avenue and it starts at the nearby River Avon and approaches the monument on the western side. It actually comes around a hill and then approaches in a straight line from the west. Now twice a year something fairly remarkable happens. At sunrise on the summer solstice and the longest which is the longest day of the year and sunset on the winter winter solstice the shortest day. 
The avenue aligns perfectly with the sun and the stone circle. The avenue is thought to be some kind of procession way. Uh, people, the people who built the monument would gather to celebrate and witness the changing of the seasons. But think about some of the engineering here. A map would be nice. Yes, I agree. A map would be nice. Let me see if I can... Let me see if I can do... Can I copy this image just into... Yes, there we go. There's Stonehenge. Let's let's move this here. There we go. This is Stonehenge. This is the this is the stone circle. Um, this stone circle was finished, I think, three thousand years ago, and the 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 ditch monument here is about five thousand years old. Um, and then this is the avenue. This is the road coming up here. The, this. This road is a modern road, but this is the avenue. Um, and so this this path approaches from the west. Um, and so if you're standing in the avenue and you're looking east, um, you're looking east on the uh, summer solstice, the sun will appear to rise between the stones. Um, and the opposite, if you're standing in the monument here, and it's the winter solstice, and the sun is setting, it sets into the stones. Uh, boo, modern road. This road isn't here anymore. This road has been demolished since. Um... And the avenue has been reconnected. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that road used to be really horrible, um, but they've redesigned the whole road network there. It's still not great, but they've destroyed that road now. Let's get rid of that. Now, we don't really know why the Neolithic Britons did this. Um, it could have been purely for astron astronomical reasons. It could have been a religious festival. Um, it could just be to mark the changing of the seasons. We don't know. Um, but we know that they got it right, and they're not the only monument to get it right. There are many, many monuments that are thousands of years old that are aligned to the stars in this way. Maybe just for fun. Um, I don't think just for fun, because when I, 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 I studied archaeology um, at college, and the current understanding is constructing Stonehenge took about 500,000 people. I don't think that would be just for fun. <laughs> so, monuments is one thing, and, can, can, and religion is another thing. But there is, of course, a problem that, across the world, people needed to solve. Um, across the world, people were watching the skies and they were ma making notes. And they were counting how many days it took for the stars to come back into the same place. Or for the moon to reach its phase the same phase again. Were there even that many people in the British Isles at the time? Yes. 500,000 is probably about the population of Britain 5,000 years ago. <laughs> um, and yes, the so the, the grey Saracen stones in Stonehenge came from about 25 miles north, and the blue stones in the cent centre came from Wales. It's quite far away. Um... But yes, so, moving on. Counting days and knowing when the seasons are going to change was very important. Um, and many people started designing calendars. Um, now, most early calendars were lunar, so they relied on the phases of the moon to track time over a course of a single year. We know now that a single day, approximately 24 hours, is the time it takes... For the Earth to spin on its axis, 
while a year, just over 365 days, is how long it takes for the Earth to orbit around the Sun. But let's take a look at some of the earlier calendar systems, how they worked and how accurate they were. So, the oldest known lunar calendar that I could find evidence of was actually found in Aberdeen, and it's about 7,000 years old. It's at a site called Warren Field, which features 12 pits, which probably had posts in them at some point. Um, and they are believed to coincide with the phases of the moon um, and form a way to track lunar months, perhaps by aligning when the moon sets in a particular phase. Um, or... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how it worked. But there was a problem. Um, you can't actually fill out an entire year just on 12 lunar months. Um, because the lunar phase and uh, the Earth's orbit don't quite line up. Um, but what was really interesting, what was found at this site, was the builders actually had a solution to this. Because of the natural terrain, their posts, or their calendar system, was aligned in a way that at the midwinter solstice, they could reset their calendar. Much like Stonehenge would thousands of years, thousands, like 2,000 years later. This alignment would have allowed people who built the calendar to reset it each year. And what is really important and what I think is really interesting is that this wasn't a farming society. This wasn't sedentary humans. These were hunter-gatherers. These were people who hunted uh, prey and so needed to know how to track the movement of herds and how the seasons would affect that. And so this is an example of humans earlier than we ever thought using astronomy, the study of the skies, to improve society, to improve their hunting efficiency, essentially, which I think is really exciting. Now, sometimes you don't have a way of having some uh, natural formation that allows you to reset your calendar, so you need other ways to fill it in. Now, a lunar year is approximately 354 days, so 12 lunar months. Um, whereas we know a solar year is about 365. So the ancient Sumerian calendar from Mesopotamia had 12 lunar months of about sort of 29 or 30 days. But what they would do would add in extra months every couple of years. Knowing when to add those months obviously required some intimate knowledge of the seasons, the length of days, and the motions of the sun and the moon. Adding an extra month every two to three years allowed civilizations like Sumer to flourish because it meant that their seasons weren't slipping and they always knew when to plant their crops and when to harvest their crops. And of course, another important aspect of tracking time for ancient civilizations is knowing when to place religious festivals. Now, I'm not going to make assumptions about what religious festivals are for, but it's certain, certainly the case that in ancient India, for example, tracking and predicting the movements of astronomical bodies was very important for allowing priests to fix the dates of Hindu and Sikh rituals. And these rituals may have been important for farming practices and animal husbandry. And again, this is really early humans using calendar systems and using astronomy to um, improve their um, improve their farming systems, to improve their lives. Um, and so. One way of doing this, the Sumerians and ancient Indian calendars used these so-called intercalary months to keep lunar years and solar years in step. Um, 
But, of course, not all calendars are lunar, and not all calendars are lunisolar. Um, early Chinese calendars relied on observations of the sun, and used 10 36-day months, with 5 or 6 transitory days to keep in time. There's an ancient, uh, sorry, there's a 10th century Icelandic calendar that instead of using a fixed number of months, uses a fixed number of weeks, and the months have variable lengths. They have 52 weeks of 7 days, and add in 4 extra days to bring the total up to 364 days. The extra, and then every couple years, they'd add in extra weeks in the summer. What I thought was really interesting about this calendar um, was that the months always start on the same day of the week. So, for example, your February, or the equivalent of February, always started on a Monday. Regardless of what year it was, you knew February started on a Monday, which I think is really interesting. What would that Chinese calendar have been called? I don't actually know. I didn't write it down. Um, but I can find out after the stream. Um, now, of course, our modern calendar has its roots in the Roman Empire. Now, it's not a lunar system, but it does have 12 months. Um, the old Roman calendar was becoming completely unworkable by the time of Julius Caesar. It was slipping completely out of sync with the, uh, with the seasons, um, and the then em emperor decided to completely reform the system. Um, and they came up with a 12-month calendar that ran from the 1st of January, over 365 days, to the 31st of December, obviously with Roman names. Uh, and later on, a fairly crucial element was added by Augustus Caesar, another Roman emperor. The addition of a leap day every four years. Because again, they were finding that their seasons were slipping. The Julian calendar was used across Europe for nearly 2,000 years in some cases. Um, until it was reformed in 1582. And like I said, some countries were using it all the way up to the 20th century. There is a story, and I can't quite verify it because I keep finding contradictory accounts, that the Russian Olympic team arrived 12 days late to the 1908 London Olympics because they hadn't switched to the Gregorian calendar. And, the, and at the time, the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar were 12 days out of sync. Um, and the Russians wouldn't change their calendar until after World War I in 1917, 1918, 1918. Um, so how about that modern calendar? The Gregorian calendar has an average length of 365.2425 days, and which closely matches the time it takes for the Earth to fully orbit the Sun. And it's achieved by using an algorithm. And the algorithm goes a little bit like this. Each year that is divisible by four is a leap year, and has an extra day in February. Unless that year is divisible by 100, in which case it does not have an extra day in February. Unless... That year is also divisible by 400, in which case it is a leap year. So 2018 or 2019, not leap years because not divisible by 4. 2020 will be a leap year because it's divisible by 4. 1800 and 1900 were divisible by 4, but not leap years. But the year 2000 is. Which seems easy, right? That, that's perfectly explainable, that's no confusion there whatsoever. It's a really simple system. <laughs> Very mathy, exactly. Now, timekeeping for religion, farming, hunting, planning birthday parties are really the cornerstone of early, astronomer, early astronomy. It's why people were doing it. But it wasn't long before those people who were priests and mystics and timekeepers 
began to wonder not just how the skies were moving, but why. What was the makeup of the universe? So let's take a look at some early astronomers, their models, and their theories for how the universe worked and how they progressed through time. As you might expect, the Greeks and the Romans got a fairly early start on this whole astronomy business, coming up with models and theories about how the heavens moved. One of the best known examples is Ptolemy, with a P, obviously. Ptolemy lived in Alexandria in the first century AD, and his book The Almagest is one of the only surviving comprehensive treaties on astronomy that we have from ancient times. Ptolemy allegedly used... <laughs> obviously, yeah, exactly. He, he allegedly used observational data from works by earlier astronomers dating back another 800 years. And he presented tables of the positions and stars of planets, which allowed readers to calculate the past and future positions of those objects. Most famously, however, was Ptolemy's model of the universe. Like most of his contemporaries, Ptolemy theorized a universe made up of rotating, transparent, celestial spheres in which objects were embedded with the Earth at their centre. The Moon, the Sun, and the five planets all had their own spheres, and an ape sphere contained the fixed stars. This model was, of course, iterated over, but largely remained in use for hundreds of years. To really get to grips with the Ptolemaic model, we need to talk about something called epicycles, and I do have another diagram which I will bring in because it's important. Oh my god, that's so big, she said. Here we go. Here, here's, here's the epicycle diagram. Let's put this here. Um, so, an epicycle describes a circular path in which a planet rotates around as it rotates around the Earth. So, the Earth is a stationary object. There is a sphere around the Earth at a distance called the deferent. That's this dashed line here. This is the celestial sphere in which a planet is embedded, for example. Now, the deferent isn't centered on the Earth. That's the cross here. Um, so it's slightly off center to the Earth. Um, and the distance here is called the eccentric. Um, and then there is a second circle, this dashed line here. This is the epicycle. Um, this is uh, essentially a circle in which the planet rotates around this circle. I can't work out how my fingers are meant to move. Here we go. The planet rotates around this circle, while the whole sphere rotates around this circle. Does that make sense? And they both rotate count counterclockwise? They both rotate rotate clockwise. Um, parallel to the motion of the sun and the earth. And why this is important is if you watch a planet in the sky over days and days and days, over months, you will find that it speeds up and it slows down. And sometimes it goes backwards. It has a retrograde mo motion. And what the epicycle does, what Ptolemy, Ptolemy worked out was using these epicycles, is you can explain and you can predict the motion, even taking into account retrograde motion, which was really important and really uh, quite amazing for the time. People rag on like geocentrism and, and we'll talk about heliocentrism centrism as well. At the end of the day, these models actually worked and they did make good predictions. Um, okay, let's get rid of this. So, of course, when you think about it, you can go outside and you can see that it is very obvious that the Earth is a stationary spherical ob object. Okay, it is surrounded by celestial spheres in which the planet 
planets are embedded and move in epicycles, a sun that orbits the Earth such that it rises in the east and sets in the west. Obviously, all of the stars are fixed in place on a sphere that is 20,000 times the radius of the Earth away from us. That is clearly the case, is it not? Obviously, I'm joking. Um, we all know that we don't live in a geocentric universe, we live in a heliocentric universe. The sun is the centre of the universe, and the celestial spheres orbit around it, not the Earth. Clearly this is the case, and we know this thanks to the marvellous work of a Polish mathematician named Nicolaus Copernicus. Copernicus lived a long and interesting life, studying in Italy for 30 years, working on, in a variety of roles in his homeland of Prussia. But his most famous work, which I will attempt to pronounce, was the De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium. Yes, I pronounced it correctly. On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres. Let's take a look at, I want to take a look at Copernicus's assumptions um, and try and explain his model, um, which he thankfully printed in a very short uh, note form in another of his books. So, let us begin. Point the first. There is no one centre of all celestial spheres or circles. Meaning, of course, that not all the spheres orbit around the same object. The moon orbits the Earth and not the sun, for example. Point the second. The centre of the Earth is not the centre of the universe, but only the centre towards which heavy bodies move, and the centre of the lunar sphere. Heavy bodies is a word that Copernicus uses here. Um, what he's saying is that objects that we know have mass, take my phone for example, move towards the Earth, obviously. But celestial objects doesn't, don't have mass, so they don't move towards the Earth. So, no problem there. Point the third. All the spheres surround the Sun as if it were in the middle of them all and therefore the centre of the universe is near the sun. Obviously. The ratio of the Earth's distance from the sun to the height of the firmament is so much smaller than the ratio of the Earth's radius to its distance from the sun than that of the distance from the Earth... Wait... Hang on, I've read this one wrong again. Is the, phone, the phone's fine. Let's try, I'm going to start again. Point the fourth. The ratio of the Earth's distance from the Sun to the height of the firmament is sm so much smaller than the ratio of the Earth's radius to its distance from the Sun that the distance from the Earth to the Sun is imperceptible in comparison with the height of the firmament. Does any of that make any sense to anyone whatsoever? What Copernicus is saying in, in his fourth point is that the distance to the stars, the firmament, is so far away that the distance between the Earth and the Sun is imperceptible. Yes, the stars are really far away. Yeah. Yeah, you could have told me that exactly. <laughs> we need a diagram. There are diagrams of the celestial spheres, and they do not help. That's why I don't have one. Um, okay. Point the fifth. Whatever motion appears in the firmament arises not from the motion of the firmament, but from the Earth's motion. The Earth, together with its circumjacent elements, performs a complete rotation on its fixed poles in a daily motion while the firmament and highest heaven abide unchanged. So what uh, Copernicus is saying here is that when we see the stars move around the Earth, like in my background here, this motion around 
the North Star here is not due to the firmament moving. It is due to the Earth's rotation. Um, so the Earth is rotating, and so it looks like the stars are moving. But in fact, the, the Earth is moving, the stars are stationary. Now, point the sixth. What appear to us as motions of the sun arise not from its motion, but from the motion of the earth and our sphere, with which we revolve around the sun like any other planet. The earth has, then, more than one motion. So this is, this is Ptolemy establishing that not only does the earth rotate, which explains the um, rising and setting of the sun, the Earth also orbits around the Sun. And he goes on to say, in point the seventh and the final point, the apparent retrograde and direct motion of the planets arises not from their motion, but from the Earth's. The motion of the Earth alone, therefore, suffices to explain so many apparent inequalities in the heavens. So, what kind of like boom like fuck ptolemy he's a moron we don't need fucking epicycles we can entirely remove um entirely remove epicycles and retrograde motion and messy orbital di diagrams by refocusing um uh on the sun instead of the earth. <laughs> Puck Ptolemy, exactly. Did did I did I say Ptolemy at some point? <laughs> My re reading science voice. Yes, it's very good. I practiced. Um, now, of course, Copernicus wasn't the last person to completely re revolutionize um, astronomy. Um, but before we get on to perhaps the most obvious person to talk about, there's one other astronomer I want to talk about from the 17th century. Um, a German astronomer named Johannes Kep Kepler, who is best known for using Copernicus's model, the heliocentric one, to develop a theory on how planets move. And his theory became the groundwork of later scientists. Now, Copernicus used something called an empirical model. And an empirical model is one that is based on observation and measurement, not on theory or logic. By observing and documenting... Can I go back? Can, can I talk about how C C Copernicus came up with heliocentrism? Um, I don't know how he came... how he started... That's a really good question. I don't know how Ptolemy began invest. Oh, Ptolemy, I said it again. How Copernicus began investigating hel heliocentrism. He wasn't the first. I do know that there were there were other people before Copernicus who had proposed heliocentric models, but they hadn't completed the work. Um, and these are all people that Copernicus would have been aware of. Um, there are, for example, um, some of you may know that, uh, the Arabic world was basically the center of science for 400 years until they were, um, annihilated by the Mongols. Um, and there were Arabic astronomers who had begun working on heliocentric models and begun replacing geocentric models. Um... So Kepler used an empirical model. He, he spent a lot of time accurately measuring the positions of the planets and our position around the sun and used them to develop um, equations and models to predict the future positions of planets. Kepler's laws can seem a little bit tricky to grasp, unlike Copernicus's incredibly easy laws. Um... And I'm going to try and explain them, but I'm going to try and not use too much math, 
because this is episode one and I don't want to scare everyone away with math. Um, so the first point, Kepler's first law, is that planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Okay, the second law, this is where it gets tricky, a radius vector that connects a planet to the sun draws out an equal area in an equal amount of time. Okay, the third law, the square of the period of the rotation of a planet around the sun is proportional to the cube of its mean distance to the sun. Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to avoid some of the maths, um, and I'll try and break these down in a way that's easy to remember, easy to understand. So the first law is really simple. It's just saying that it, orbits around the sun are ellipses, not perfect circles. Um, the foci of an ellipse that um, Kepler talks about is essentially the off-center point. You have two foci in an ellipse that define its shape, um, and you can put where the sun is at one of those. Um, well, I'll probably go more into orbital mechanics at some point in a later episode, and we'll really dig into the numbers that make an orbit but for now we just need to remember that they're elliptical and so the second law is where it gets tricky what i want you to picture is the sun the sun is here and here's a planet okay and the planet goes around in an orbit like this okay it gets close to the sun and it gets far away from the sun okay now imagine a line between the sun and it's and the planet when the planet moves through its orbit that line sweeps out like a triangle shape okay um and so when the planet is close to the sun it sweeps out like a short stubby triangle and when it's far away from the sun it sweeps out like a a long stretched out triangle okay and so what the second law says is that in an equal amount of time, the planet will always sweep out the same area with that line. And so close to the sun, when you have a short stubby triangle, you have to cover more of your orbit to make the same area as when you're far out and you're making a really skinny triangle. And so you have to go... You're, you're covering a smaller segment of the ellipse when you're far out in an equal amount of time. Um, so close to the sun, you're covering a greater distance in the same amount of time to cover the same area. So you move faster. And when you're distant from the sun, you're covering a smaller distance in the same amount of time to make the same area, so you go slower. So as a planet goes around in its orbit, as it approaches the sun, it gets faster and faster and faster and then slows down again. It gets faster and it slows down again. It gets faster and it slows down again. Does that make sense? Sounds like a slingshot? A little bit, yeah. Um, so that's the second law. And the fir third law is the one that actually has, like, math in it, if you really want to dig into it. Um, the square of the period of the planet's rotation around the sun is proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. So you calculate the mean distance, and then the amount of time it takes to go around the sun is proportional to the cube of that distance. And what this tells us in a simple way is planets that are further out take longer to orbit. So Jupiter has a longer orbital period than the Earth because its mean 
distance is greater. Um, and that scales as the square of the rotation period and the cube of the distance. Um, so that's Kepler. Now, Kepler's laws are empirical, like I said, um, because Kepler just didn't have the um, mathematical tools to uh, come up with them from a theoretical background. And he didn't have the physics knowledge yet. The physics knowledge didn't exist. Now, if anyone has been listening particularly keenly, you may have noticed no one had the mathematical tools. Yes. You may have noticed that there's a word that is very important in astronomy and in orbital dynamics and in space that I haven't used yet. I haven't said it once. I've been very careful not to. It's gravity. So in 1685, Isaac Newton began working on perhaps one of the most important books ever written in science. The Principia Mathematica. Newton developed methods and techniques to describe the world around us. He developed calculus. He built the foundations of the forces of motion. And he crucially, he showed us the law of universal gravitation. Sir Isaac Newton, the deadliest motherfucker in space. Now, Newton proposed that there was a force which he admitted he could not explain that pulled all bodies together. Rem remember from Copernicus's model that heavy bod bodies only fall towards the Earth. Newton suggested that all bodies have mass and all bodies are attracted to each other. And he did this in quite an interesting way. First, he proposed that a law of gravitation explained all of Kepler's laws and was accurate to all of the planets. And he showed this. He showed that every single planet um, every single planet obeyed a law of gravity, which he, which he uh, developed mathematically. Um, and so those laws of motion could be universalized. He showed that everything showed that. Um, yeah, he thought calculus would freak people out. Yes. He did, he did he did do he did invent calculus for it though um, so he showed that because all of the planet sun systems obey the same laws of motion that those laws of motion must be universal and here's the kicker here's here's the thing not to be outdone by himself Newton then shows that because gravity is universal none of the planets actually obey. Keplerian principles. There are perturbations. You can't treat each planet as an isolated system. Because Jupiter pulls on the Sun and the Sun pulls on Jupiter, but Jupiter also pulls on the Earth and it pulls on Mars, and the Moon pulls on the Earth and the Sun, and the Sun pulls on the Moon, and every particle in the universe pulls on every other particle in the universe. The last book in the Principia is Newton explaining perturbations in planetary mo movements. And this became his, his white whale in the end. Um, Newton spent the rest of his life trying to solve something called the free body problem. How can you analytically, using mathematical theoretical techniques, predict the position of free bodies in mutual gravitation. I'm going to leave that up to you guys to research on yourselves because it's incredibly interesting and we'll, we will probably do an entire, we could probably do an entire episode on the free body problem. It's fascinating. Um, but Newton never solved it. 
you never found an answer. Um, now, he revolutionized mathematics, physics, astronomy, optics, and Newton kind of did a lot of stuff. He was kind of a big deal. Something, something linear algebra. Yes, could do an entire series on it. Probably could, yes. Now, there's one more jump I want to talk about. Actually, there, there's two more jumps I want to talk about. The first is how do we get away from heliocentrism? Um, heliocentrism stayed a popular model for hundreds of years. Um, the first evidence against it was in the 1700s. Uh, William Herschel um, William Herschel made a map of of um, of the universe. I might have I might have a hang on. Do I have? No, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have have the image up. William, uh, look up William Herschel's map of the galaxy. Um, so William Herschel was a was an amateur astronomer in the 1700s, and he made a map by measuring the distances. Um, not even measuring the distances. He just he counted stars and just assumed they were all at equal distances. And he was the first person to find that we live in a disk in stars, of, of stars, not in a sphere. But Herschel's, Herschel came from a heliocentric point of view, and his map was inherently flawed because he thought the sun was still the centre of the universe. And it wasn't actually until, like, 1918 that we found um that we found out that um we lived in a galaxy and we were not in the center of that galaxy um i don't remember the astronomer's name this is something i didn't write down in my notes because i read it like an hour ago um but there was an astronomer who was measuring distances to globular clusters so like clusters of stars um and he found that they were in weird positions if you assume the sun was the center of the universe and eventually discovered that in fact the sun is just one star orbiting around a common uh, center of mass. Yes, Carolyn Herschel was also very, very important to that work. Um, Carolyn Herschel was amazing and did some amazing work alongside William shouldn't be forgotten of course um thank you for mentioning that um and so going from heliocentrism to galactocentrism was one step but it was very short-lived it was incredibly short-lived um and the next bit of the story i'm going to tell you most of you have probably heard almost definitely if you even have the slightest shred of inf interest in astronomy you have heard this story um, so I'm going to tell it differently. Um, we begin in 1912 with an American astronomer called Vesto Slipher. Vesto got his doctorate in 1909, and he spent his entire career at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. And he did something fairly amazing that no one had done before. Using a technique called spectroscopy, he measured the redshifts of strange nebulae, clouds of gas and dust and stars that, at the time, people didn't really know what they were. He was the first person to measure those redshifts, and a redshift is essentially a measure of the speed an object is moving. Guy, I can't remember, was ha Harlow Shapley. That's the one, yes. Um... And Vesto Slipher so pioneered using redshifts for measuring velocities in space. He measured the velocities of nebulae. He measured the velocities of planets and discovered planetary rotation. Um, he used it to study the sun's rotation. Really important astronomer. Did some amazing work. And so he was doing this in 1912. Around about the same time... Um, at Harvard University, Harvard Observatory, 
um, teams of human computers were working on a huge array of statistical problems in astronomy. And one of these human computers was called Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Um, and she discovered a relationship between the period of varying stars, so stars that vary in brightness, called Cepheid variables, and their absolute brightness. Yes, redshift is the elongation of light waves as they, as things move away from us. Um, so we have Vesto Slifer measuring redshifts, and we have Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovering the relationship between the period of a Seaford variable and its brightness. And you know how bright something is, you know, you can work out how far away it is. Um, and then, of course, we come to a very important man in astronomy, Edwin Hubble. And in 1919, at the Mount Wilson Observatory in California, Edwin Hubble discovered something shocking around for everyone involved in astronomy. He used the period brightness relationship of Cepheid variable stars to measure the distance to nebulae it, that he thought were inside our own galaxy. But he discovered, to his shock and the rest of the worldwide scientific community, that these clouds were not inside the Milky Way. They were, in fact, hundreds of thousands of light years away. They were galaxies in their own right. And, like most people in our stories, not content with showing us that the universe was much bigger than we thought. In 1922, Hubble published a paper that showed that the redshift of galaxies increased as galaxies, as their distance did. And galaxies further away were moving faster. The universe is expanding, which head exploding, what the hell is going on? We, the, we just revolutionized the entire film field of astronomy. Congratulations, Edwin Hubble. We're going to name it a constant and a law after you. We're, uh, you're going to get all of the funding. You're going to do all of the important work. Um, in a hundred years, you're going to have a telescope named after you. Um, basically, you're the most important person in the world, and we're all going to bow down to you. Um, but there's some part of that story that sometimes goes unsaid, and I think is really important. Um, I told you that Vesto Slifer made redshift measurements in 1912 of those galaxies. Hubble used the same measurements. He literally stole the measurements from Slifer's paper, used his own distance measurements and made a graph, and didn't cite Vesto Slifer's paper. He passed them off as his own work. Okay. Not only that, Hubble used Henrietta Swan Levitt's law wrong. If you go back, and I've, I've done this, I've read Hubble's papers. Hubble's measurements of the distances to Andromeda and Triangulum and the other nearby galaxies are wrong by about a factor of two or three in some cases. One galaxy he gets off by like a factor of five because he didn't apply the law correctly. The scatter on his relationship is enormous and there's no real indication that it would continue beyond the local universe. Now, time proved Hubble correct, but I believe he kind of got there by sheer dumb luck and a little bit of disingenuous paper writing. Um, 
in that Hubble gets all of the papers and all of the prizes and all of the awards. Vesto Slifer won a couple of awards for his work, but is mostly forgotten to uh, the annals of history. And Henrietta Swan Leavitt, while a big name in uh, sort of science activism now, died before Hubble published his papers. She never saw the fruits of her labour. And I'm sort of bringing this up, I'm talking about this in, in, a, in a lesson about the history of astronomy, because it's important. We mentioned Caroline Herschel earlier. It's important to remember the hidden people in the background. Um, we talk about the greats like Hubble and Einstein, but we forget about the smaller names around them. Because they were astronomers too, but because of the way the world is, we tend to focus on single, brilliant individuals. And as we set out on our journey together to learn and discover, I believe that all of us here today can do better. Don't be like Hubble. Don't plagiarise people, cite your work, and enjoy doing your work and doing it with other people. That's the end of today's lesson. Today we've discussed what astronomy is and how it's done. We talked about the history of science uh, as timekeeping and calendar making, and some of the important faces and discoveries. I hope you all enjoyed the show, but I'm not going to go anywhere just yet. Now it's time for the fun bit. We've got time to hang out. Has anyone got any questions? Legit. Let's just hang out and chat. How often will these shows be on? I don't know yet. Um, what I want to get is some like good feedback on the structure of the show, and then I've got to work out how long it's gonna like make, uh, how long it's gonna take me to make episodes and everything. If I were to make my own calendar, where would I start? Um. I have no idea. Um, let's do a weird calendar that's based on the uh, um, rising and setting of Andromeda. Let's do that. That sounds like a great idea. When can I expect an RI gig? Um, one day, hopefully. Why is dark matter and why does it make me very uncomfortable? We'll do an episode on dark matter at some point, definitely. Um, but why is dark matter? Um, lots of reasons. We, we, we know that dark matter exists for lots of reasons. Um, the basic one is that... Um, there is more mass in the universe than we can see. We know that from a lot of places. We know that from the rotation curves of, of um, the rotation curves of galaxies. We know that from uh, studies of gravitational lensing um, and models of the early universe. And yeah, there's a lot of mass out there that we can't see. And that's what dark matter is, quite simply. I did study archaeology. So when I was doing my A-levels at college, I, I did physics, maths, biology, and chemistry in my first year. And then I dropped chemistry because it was crap. And I took archaeology instead, which was amazing. Yeah, we know it from a little bit from the CMB as well. We always have the worry of what if our maths is wrong. So there's, I like I can't really dive into the details of it because I'm not a philosopher or a mathematician. Um, but there is certainly that there's a lot of interest, and a lot of people have a lot of very intelligent conversations about whether math is universal. Like, is maths universal? Is 
is addition something that is always correct? Um, which I think is really interesting, and um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting subject, but not something I have expertise in. Yeah, every model we have is going to be imperfect. Though apparently not general relativity. Apparently general relativity is perfect. Einstein got everything correct. General relativity has never been proven wrong. Um, how is dark matter different from dark energy? Well, so dark matter is stuff that has mass that is affected by gravity, but none of the other fundamental forces of the universe. And it explains why, for example galaxies rotate faster than they would if they were just baryons. Dark energy is the explanation for the apparent acceleration in the expansion of the universe because distant galaxies are travelling faster than we expected them to be if the universe was not accelerating. Oh, when it comes to dark matter. So, so T-Fox, yes, there are lots of alternative... Um, there are lots of alternative models that try to explain away... Um, try to explain away dark matter in different ways. So, so there's modified Newtonian gravity is one of, is one of these. Um, and it attempts to say that at greater distances, gravity is dis is different. Um, essentially, they they add terms to Newton's law of gravitation and say, well, when you're really far away, gravity behaves differently. Um, but those models often don't predict some of the really weird phenomena we see. Like they don't re replicate the distribution of supernovae and their redshifts um, or they don't predict the cosmic microwave background correctly um, why do astronomers get upset when my colleagues at CERN don't believe in dark matter um, lots of reasons mainly because uh, the lambda called dark matter model is the most accurate cosmological model ever designed and um that being wrong would cause a lot of problems someone once told me that there might not be a heat def because information caught in black holes means that there's a limit to the amount of entropy you can maximize um i think i vaguely heard of that but i'd have to actually sit down and read about it before I try to speculate. Um, I suggest, I think PBS Space Time on YouTube has some really good videos on heat death and black holes and entropy. Um, definitely not my specialist field, um, but definitely, definitely worth a look. Um, any other questions on what we did today? Um, or any, any, any thoughts? I wonder, one of the things I'm thinking about is whether or not I need slides. I kind of don't want to make slides, because that's going to take fucking forever. <laughs> Do you know how long it takes to make, like, an hour-long presentation on, in PowerPoint? Yeah, visual aids are good. What I was thinking about is getting like a little graphics tab, just getting like a really cheap graphics tab and being able to sketch diagrams. Yeah, like a digital whiteboard. Yeah, some graphics. I'm not doing PowerPoint slides. Mini whiteboard. Yeah, a mini whiteboard could do I don't know if a mini whiteboard would show up on the camera, though, because these lights are really bright. 
Um, I'd be worried that no matter how dark a pen I got, it would... Um, uh, it would just wash out. Um, the silent peas weren't silent? But Ptolemy... That sounds that sounds dumb. Yeah, like so I was originally looking at like a graphics um not like a graphics tablet but just like a, a drawing surface that you like USB plug into a PC that I could draw on. Um might help and just draw in paint. Like I don't wanna um I don't wanna spend um I don't wanna spend like forty pound or more on a graphics tablet, but yeah, paint is probably good enough because if I were teaching in an apps and in an actual classroom, you'd all have to deal with my shitty drawing anyway. Yeah, I use GIMP normally for um, for my graphic stuff. Yeah, we don't have the constant. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard Spanish people say Starbucks, so. Languages are weird. I got really into linguistics at one point. If if I could just like do a whole if I could just do a whole course on linguistics, I'd do that. <laughs> um yeah, digital whiteboard at some some point. Yeah, talking about capital laws would have been really yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'll have a look at I'll have a look at getting a cheap graphics tablet and see what I could do with that. Um So one thing like was the length okay today? We definitely went longer. So I practiced this a couple of times. And they were, and it was forty-five minutes. But we actually went to about an hour, um, an hour and ten. Um, it's what quarter past, nearly twenty past eight now. Um, yeah, I, f I was thinking about an hour or so. Seemed good. Length was good. Okay, great. So I'll aim for. Uh, so let me let me see what what's the word count in this in this script. How do I do a word count in Evernote? Can I do a word count in Evernote? I don't know if I can. Maybe I'll have to copy it into Word. Um, let me see what the word count. No, what have I done? No, I deleted it. Load, load up Word. Yeah, an hour lecture. Yeah. A teleprompter? I don't think a teleprompter would particularly help me. It's not zero words. Word. Oh wow, this this was a five thousand word script. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I 
I worded very well. Um, yeah, so this might need to be like a monthly thing. I don't think I can crack out 5,000 words every two weeks and write my book and do work and do all my streaming. Yeah, just write bullet points. I can write my thesis. I wrote my own thesis, damn it. So I don't just want to write in bullet points because I don't trust myself to improvise around them well enough. Um, I might make these scripts available on Patreon if people want to see them, but I'll see about that. Um, so yeah, that's something something I'm going to have to think about, especially with the like how often these episodes will be, especially if they're going to be an hour long. Um, I think maybe once a month would be the best bet. Um, trying to go more often than that will kill me, probably. And like other things will, other things will suffer. Um, but yeah. I'll see what I can do in that sense. So we'll probably try and do another episode next month at some point. And then if we can get stuff out faster, then that'll be good. Um, okay. Um, I think I'm going to head off. Um, and that'll be, that'll be the end of episode one of... Astronomy 101, thank you for coming and watching. I think I have like a kind of a lesson plan. Let me let me give you a let me give you a sneak peek. Um, next episode in a month's time will be on uh, naked eye astronomy, finding constellations and coordinate systems. Will this be on the test? Everything will be on the test. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I will see you next time.